Good morning, everyone. My name is Sharon Sherry, and I um, have the pleasure of speaking this morning with Jane Ann Krentz. Jane, who really needs no introduction to us, um, uses three different pen names for her three worlds. As Jane Ann Krentz, her married name, she writes contemporary romantic suspense. She uses Amanda Quick for her novels or historical, of historical suspense. And Jane Castle, which was her birth name, is reserved these days for her stories of futuristic paranormal and romantic suspense. Jane says, I'm often asked why I use a variety of pen names. The answer is that the, this way readers know which of my three worlds they're entering into when they pick up one of my books. And that's that lovely brand promise, isn't it? <laughs> well, that was, that's what I say in my bio to explain what was really one of the stupidest decisions I ever made. <laughs> I, I'm stuck with them now. All I can tell you is that if you're trying to write I do not recommend using multiple pen names. Just don't go there. Don't go there. It's nothing but a, a, a headache trying to get people to remember three names. It's just not going to happen. You can't build three names and keep them, keep them going. It's like juggling chainsaws, you know. But at the time, I either got trapped in a contract that I shouldn't have signed. So I actually, at one point, signed away my birth name. That was back before I thought I needed an agent. Um, got the birth name back, but by then I had invented um, Stephanie James and Amanda Quick. And so I told myself that I would drop the, one that, the ones that didn't work. I figured I would just, over time, I would figure out which, which audience worked best with my kind of books, the historical, the futuristic, or the um, contemporary. And then by the time I was ready to make that decision, all three worlds had gained their own audiences. And it's very true that people don't read across those three worlds. Um, some people do. I'm very grateful to those who do. Um, but most of my readers, I would say, prefer me under one name or another, which means they, since I, my voice has always felt the same to me, I think what it really means is they prefer one fictional landscape to the other. They just like the historical landscape or they like the futuristic landscape or they like the contemporary and I totally get that. So the result is it wasn't the plan. I now have three names. <laughs> Keeps you busy, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, you're in Seattle in the US, yeah? Yes. What's it like weather-wise over there at the moment? Um, Otherwise, it's actually turning into a very nice start of summer, end of spring. You know, we're kind of in the heart of spring, I suppose. And then next month, June, for us, would be the start of summer. Um, but we can't spend much time outside, so it's kind of a waste this year. That's my, uh, that's my next question. Your website photo is you wearing a mask at the moment. Um, how have you and your family been coping in isolation? I think over time we've actually kind of adapted. <laughs> I, I worry that we we might become a um, a nation of agoraphobics. <laughs> we actually get so used to being at home, we don't know, we're afraid of the outside world. Um, everybody's anxious about the opening up that is starting. Um, it's so you're supposed to wear a mask. That's really all they've got. And the big question is, is that going to be enough to prevent, you know, the spike that everybody fears is coming? And I just think everybody's nervous. They keep, most people like, remember Seattle's a very liberal city. So we tend to be more cautious about and follow the rules about this kind of thing. So around here, everybody who does go out is masked up and is keeping the six feet thing and all that good stuff. That's all we can do. What are you most looking forward to as restrictions ease? Getting my hair done. <laughs> I think two things. I'd like to get my teeth cleaned and I'd like to get my hair done. Those are the two services that are the most dangerous. The, of all the things you could do, like go shopping or, you know, buy groceries or take a drive or, you know, go to the park, the, um, the two physically most dangerous things are going to be the physical contact stuff, and that's dentistry and hair salons. So I don't know. 
interestingly, our Prime Minister said you could have a 30 minute appointment at the hairdresser until his wife said, don't be ridiculous, it takes me longer than that. So he yeah. extended it to an hour and a half. <laughs> well, we just, we just don't know what we're playing with. I mean, we're playing with fire, That's, we just don't know. Um, I, they keep bringing up um, references to the 1918 flu, which decimated so, so many countries. And the US was very hard hit at that time. And the most amazing thing to those of us from this generation is that our grandparents never talked about it. Obviously they lived through it or we wouldn't, you know, <laughs> we wouldn't be here, but it's like it had never happened. I don't remember a single reference in my childhood to the 1918 flu. And it was horrible. Mm, I that, yeah, I just find that interesting that it, they'll t they talk about past wars but not about the flu that mm -hmm. killed, killed about killed 10 percent of the ten percent of the people on the earth at the time. A lot more people than died in the horrible war. So, yeah, very interesting human psychology. So I'm guessing what happens is that once you get back to something looking normal, you, you just put it behind you, and and you just move on until the next disaster strikes. Be my guess. Yeah. But then you remember. Um, all of us have lived with natural disasters all of our lives. So a lot of them we take for, every time you get in a car, you're taking a risk for crying out loud. Um, but here on the West Coast, it's earthquakes. In the Midwest, it's tornadoes. You know, I mean, and we sort of blow them off. <laughs> it's kind of what humans do, I guess. Yeah, we're good at that, I think. Yeah. So have you climbed on the bread baking wagon or was that kind of a phenomenon in Australia? No, no, it was huge here too. Um, there was a huge competition, especially for sourdough, to create the sourdough. <laughs> I did not go that route. I, I knew I know my limitations, <laughs> and creating a sourdough starter wasn't going to be on the list. No, um, I hear you. But uh, but then I've got my writing, so I was okay. So it's time to turn now to your latest release under the name of Amanda Quick. The premise for Close Up made me think that it really could be a series if you wanted it to. Is there any chance you're thinking about serialising, Vivian? No, because I like to start with a new couple in each book. The serialization part would be the town mm -hmm. and the core characters, uh, such as Luther Pell and Raina Kirk and uh, um, Oliver Ward and his Irene. I mean, those you'll, the, side, the characters from previous novels will reappear. But for my own storytelling, I like to kind of reinvent the relationship each time. And I don't want to have to go back into it, a, res a relationship that I have resolved to my satisfaction and open it up and create a disaster that blows it up and then I have to fix it again. You know what I mean? It's like, I want to work with new, new problems and new people. Even though I'm usually working with the same themes, I often work with themes of trust and, um, people who are reinventing themselves, starting over, finding a new life. It's, those are my core themes that I usually work with, regardless of the characters. So where did the inspiration for an art photographer turned murder scene photographer come from? I happened to come across a book. Um, it was written by Arthur Felling, who in this country was the one who pretty much created the whole noir image he he was a he was a a report uh, a photo and what do you call it they call them spot re, spot photographers basically they were freelancers who rushed to the scenes of the crimes to get the pictures of the body on the sidewalk and 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 watch the uh the, the, the police make the arrest and you know they they went for and then they rushed their pictures to the newspapers to get them on the front page and it was quite a life. It was a, but it had a very low respectability <laughs> level. It was, it was seen as really, a, you know, five bucks a picture. It was, it was not respected as photography. And the other side at the same time was art photography, which was trying to be taken seriously by the art world. And that conflict between the art photography and the crime scene photography um, or the tabloid photography, I guess you would call it, um, 
that get, that gave me a plot right there. I mean, I didn't have to look any further than that, you know, that I had, oh, there's a heroine who's trying to make it as an artist, but she's paying the bills by doing the crime scene photography and she can't afford to have that secret revealed or the art community will not take her seriously. <laughs> so, so I, so I had, once I had that idea, it just kind of rolled forward. All right. So it does. Now we haven't been joined, unfortunately, by Priya Chandra, but her question to you was, are there any more Amanda Quick books planned? Yes, absolutely. I'm writing the next one now. It's called The Lady Has a Past. Um, and it's set in the 1930s world too. Right. This is 1930s. Um, I, I should, I, my 1930s is, is, is the glamorous myth of 1930s California, not the depression era. <laughs> I'm, I'm working with what we, we recognize from the movies of that time. Um, that's, that's the glam part of the whole thing. So. Well, we all need a bit of glamour, I think. Yes. So what can you tell our readers about your 2021 release coming up, All the Colours of the Night under the Jane Ann Krentz brand? It looks, it sounds like a really explosive book with lots of action and steam. <laughs> with, with this, this is the middle book of a trilogy that I started with The Vanishing. And it's kind of going back to the whole psychic thing, which is, I've loved to play with that since the beginning of my career. Um, I did a lot of it under the Arcane Society logo, I guess you would say. Um, and in this case, I'm limiting it to a trilogy and it's set in the contemporary setting and it's all about the secrets that are spilling out of a secret government lab that was doing paranormal research in back in the last century, back in the 1950s and 60s. And these are the descendants of the people who were affected by one of the experiments that went horribly awry. <laughs> the government experiment going horribly awry, who knew? Um, and now it's three generations later and these, and these characters are my heroes and heroines and the modern world is now, they're dealing with the problems that are coming out of the grave, so to speak, from that disaster back in the 50s and 60s. So it's, it gives me lots of chance to work with the whole psychic thing, which I just love. And, and uh, All the Colors of Night is book two in that series. Sounds like fun. I'm going to ask Susie to open her mic and ask her question. Here I am. Um, now I know you as Amanda Quick mainly, <laughs> plus, plus I love the arcane books, obviously. Um, my question is, you've been writing historical romances for decades, yet you still come up with new and intriguing mysteries and stories. How do you manage that? And how do you find new ways to put your heroines in trouble? <laughs> One of the advantages that having my three worlds has given me is it refreshes me to come out of one world and move into the other. There are stories and plot ideas you just can't use in the past that you can do in the contemporaries that you can't do in the future. You know, it gives me, a, it, it refreshes me to come out of one landscape and move into the other. I usually get the plot ideas out of the research. Uh, for example, in, um, in this current book, in, in close-up, once I had that whole photography thing, I had a plot. I mean, I just, you know, it, it was just a question of figuring it all out, but I knew where I was going with it and I knew how I was going to use it. So in, I, I appreciate that you think the books feel fresh because um, I try to make them fresh for myself is what happens. It, I, I can only really write these stories for myself first and then hope that other people can get into them and enjoy them. I've always felt that if you enjoy my books, it's probably because we have a lot in common in terms of core values, um, worldviews, um, sense of humor. <laughs> I, I, I think, <laughs> I, you know, if, if we don't share those things, you're probably not going to come back to me again and again. You might read one or two books and that'd be it. Um, because I think an author's voice is, has to resonate with us if we're gonna come back to that author again and again. And it's probably because we have a lot in common. <laughs> 
Oh, that's nice to know. <laughs> All right. We're here in Australia and I'm in Seattle, but other than that, we have a lot in common. <laughs> okay. Moving um, on. Well, oh, sorry, sorry, can I say something else? My lap. Um, when we when we met in Brisbane, I said to you, I started writing historical romances because of you. And people used to say to me, oh, aren't they so boring, though? You know, don't you just sit around drinking cups of tea? And I used to say, <laughs> no, you haven't read Amanda Quick's books then. <laughs> no one sits around. <laughs> that, that was a great event. I, I, was, <laughs> I had such a good time. Such a good time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on. She hasn't joined us, unfortunately, but I have a question from Helen Howe. Going back to the Jane Castle pieces, could you please release the St Helens books, Amaryllis, Zinnia and Orchid, as an e-book? And um, write more dust bunnies, please. Hmm, I thought they were. Um, I'll have to check. I, I was under the impression that those three books had been released as ebooks. I'll double check. That's all I can do. Uh, check with my agency. Maybe what I'm remembering is that they were released as audio. I know they went into something else besides print and I thought it was ebook, but it might have been audio. I'll, um, I'll look it up. Thank you. Um, how do you research your books? Your armchair? Or do you travel? You know, a lot of it's armchair. I, I usually buy a lot of books on the subject um, once I get going uh, to familiarize myself with that world, you know, whatever it might be like photography, for example, which I didn't know much about. Um, and I'm a former librarian. There are no ex librarians. <laughs> um, and so I, I know how to do research. I know how to evaluate sources. I mean, it's the basic, things they teach you in library school are, you know, how to, how to find credit, credible sources, how to make sure that what you're looking at is the right, right materials. You learn to tell the difference between uh, primary sources and secondary sources, um, all that kind of basic research stuff. So, so I have the skill set kind of accidentally because I used to be a librarian. I saw on your website that you re-released Flash earlier this year. What changed in the 22 years since you wrote it? I didn't choose that. I, that's an old publisher. They sat on those rights. I couldn't get them back. They wouldn't give them back, but they didn't do anything with them. So it's like, you know, if you're not going to do anything with them, give them back to me. Um, it used to be automatically in this country that you got your rights back after seven years if the book had been out of print that long. That was the copyright rule. When digital publishing hit, they can claim it's always in print. So getting rights back is almost incredibly difficult now in this country. So the publisher sat on Flash for all those years and then all of a sudden they decided to release it out. <laughs> You'll have to ask them why now? I have no idea. <laughs> I'm going to ask Alyssa to unmute now and ask her question. Great. First of all, I'd love to say that it's been a wonderful opportunity to listen to you, Jane, and thank you, Jane, and thank you very much for being here and being so generous with your time. And I'm really enjoying also the vivacity and how uplifting at this time of the morning for me all these colours are. It's beautiful <laughs> colour therapy that we're getting as well as, uh, as listening to you. But my question is, and you've touched on how how much you enjoyed coming to Australia and all the ARA events that you attended. And I know when you were on my blog last year, you mentioned that, uh, or the year before, you mentioned that uh, you were planning a trip to Australia again, and then that fell through. So obviously things are up in the air or aren't up in the air at the moment with all the COVID restrictions and travel, but do you have any sort of time frame you're thinking about coming back to our shores? The way I would get there would be on the cruise ship again. Um, because I really don't, <laughs> unlike you folks who are so willing to get on an airplane for 25 hours, I just can't even face the thought, but I'm happy to get on a cruise ship. It just takes a lot longer to get there. So I guess the answer is when the cruise ships are safe again, I'd like to go back. That was such, I, I keep telling Frank, we were so lucky. We did so much cruising while we could because we saw so many parts of the world that 
we might not get another chance to see for a long time, if ever. And anyhow, to answer your question, that's how I get there. <laughs> and I would love to do it again. Oh, well, hopefully we'll see you here again, you know, yeah. in the next few years. Yeah, please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Alyssa. Yeah. Um, can we now, um, Malvina, you had a question for Jane. Well, I did, but I think it's been answered um, because I, I just asked what's, what's coming for you next. So I think you, you've actually answered that one. Um, Anything else so, you'd like to ask? Um, well, I'd, I'd like to know um, what do readers, and hello, thanks for joining us. It's just lovely to see you again. I met you at the ARA event in Sydney um, when that was on, and that was a lovely, lovely that was event. That great. Another great event. Yeah. They all were, yeah. 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 Uh, um, what do readers say is their favourite book? Have you, have you got one that keeps on coming up as the, the reader favourite or anything like that? Well, it sort of depends which world. Um, okay. Yep. In the historical world, I hear either about Ravished. Yes, which, that's my favourite. <laughs> there you are. Or the Arcane Society. Right. It's kind of, that's, those are the two that I, I'm most likely to hear from that world. Um, <laughs> from the futuristic world, it's anything with dust bunnies. <laughs> okay. um, and from the contemporary world, that, off, that is either the most recent one, because that's what's probably fresh in people's minds, or they'll go back to Family Man, um, Perfect Partners, um, you know, it sort of depends on where they started with me. Okay. People tend to, re on an author they like and go back to, they tend to remember that first book because that's where they got the hit. Whatever connection they made with that book took them into all the rest of the books. So they kind of fondly remember that first one, whichever one it happened to be. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but Ravished probably is the one from... The Amanda Quick World. It's just lovely. Oh. It's it's just lovely. I can reread it and enjoy <laughs> it all over again. I, I don't know how many times I've reread it because it's just wonderful. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Malvina. I, so, who is your favourite fictional character of all time, and why? My favourite. Fi oh, Nancy Drew. <laughs> Did you, were the Nancy Drew books big in Australia too? Was that, they were, okay, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I consider those my formative books. And then the next most formative books would have been um, Andre Norton, who wrote uh, science fiction in this country. Uh, but it was science fiction with a psychic vibe, not the hardware stuff, but the, the thing I was in love with, which was the telepathy and the sensitivity and the, uh, you know, the psych, the whole psychic thing. Um, so I would say those were my two influences. And the author who probably changed my life with one book was Anne McCaffrey. And the book was called uh, Restory. I think it died. I think the reason she moved on to um, Dragons was because Nobody bought, this was, it was true futuristic romance, just as we know it and I write it today. It had all those elements going for it and there was no market for it. And I stumbled across the book purely by accident. And I thought, this is it, this is what I wanna write. And so the first book I ever wrote was in that style with a futuristic setting, never sold. <laughs> but one thing I've learned is that being too far ahead of the curve is not where you want to be as a writer. It's as bad as being too far behind. Yeah, I hear you. But I love Anne McCaffrey and I've read pretty much everything she ever wrote. Um, okay. If you could have lunch with anyone, alive or dead, who would you choose and why? I'd go back to Australia and have lunch with you guys. <laughs> That's, that, was, that was the best time I ever had <laughs> for lunch. Yeah. It was a fun time. Um, and don't forget, I said I'd take you out to lunch when you get here again. <laughs> I'll hold you to it. <laughs> Have any of your characters been based on people you've met? No. Um, I'm sure 
I'm sure they incorporate some quirks or, or abilities or um, something. I, you know, I'm sure I, I give them skill sets or whatever. But um, I, my characters are archetypes. It, and I create them from scratch to, to, they have a mission in the story. You know, it, they have a, a job in the story. And I don't want to be tied to trying to make them do something that some real world person might do it. I, you know, I need to be free to use the character as I, as I want the character to, to do it, to, to be. And that pretty much makes it impossible to pattern them on somebody because then, but having said that, I'll give them, I'll give them problems that real world problems, like a lot of my characters have panic attacks. That's because I have panic attacks. <laughs> so, so things like that I will use, but, um, but no, they're, they're archetypes, they're fictional. If, thank you. If anyone on our audience has another question for Jane, please raise your hand. Okay, Heather, one moment. Unmute, please. Hi Jane, just going back to your the you said the first book you wrote was the futuristic. How hard is it to come up with new ideas in that future world? And you know, do you base anything on what you've you you use now and going into the future? When I set up that original world on Harmony and Rain what became Rain Shadow and then now everybody just calls them the Dust Bunny books. I had no idea the series was going to run that long. Mm. I thought two or three, four books, maybe if I'm lucky. I loved writing them, but I didn't think there would be much of a market. So as I realized I could keep writing them, I had to keep inventing stuff. I had to keep building that world. I keep, so mm. I added all the undergrounds, forests, the jungle, and I added the, um, you know, in the, in the latest ones, there's a, a ghost city, you know? I mean, so I, I, I have to keep expanding it. But I think I've found the perfect setting for it now because with Illusion Town, because Illusion Town is basically um, Las Vegas on Harmony. And that gives me a lot of material to work with. So I'll, I think I'll be staying there for a while because I, I can spin off from there. I can spin off interesting characters. And it's, it's such an over the top world here. You know, it's easy to make it over the top there. Probably the basic thing that I tied myself to going, I didn't want to make too many rules for myself going in. I wanted the world to be able to expand. Mm. So the one thing I tied it to was the form of, of, of power, the equivalent of our oil and gas and natural gas, the physical way the machines and the people uh, operate, cars, you know, how, how it all worked. And I needed something for that that was something unique and that's where amber psychic amber comes in because amber amber is able to handle electricity you know there is something there physically that it can do and so when i added it as a as a psychic by something that you could manipulate with psychic talent um i had a logical for me logical piece of science that i could work from and the same with the crystals because we use crystals for so much so many purposes now and we grow them in labs you know and we use them in computers and so there's so they so they have an exotic ring but at the same time we know they work <laughs> but they have yeah. they have potential yeah so that so that i kind of set that up and then i also wanted it to be set up so that it wasn't too futuristic quote unquote hence i had the the, the whole world had been set back by the closing of the curtain, had been set back to a, a more primitive state, and it's been rebuilding itself ever since because they got cut off from the homework. For those of you who haven't <laughs> read those books, this is a long story. The basic theories, they were colonists from Earth. They got cut off from the home world. They were never going to get back to the home world. All their machines quit and died on them because the machines were based on earth-based technology. And so they were thrown back into what I saw as the equivalent of about the 18th, 19th century. That, that was where I started them out. And then I, in the setting there, they've moved up to where we are now. 
So there, so it, it doesn't seem too alien to read it, if you know what I mean, because it's basically the 21st century as we know it, except with a few tweaks <laughs> and dust bunnies. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that. Ladies, it's time to say goodbye to the lovely Jane. Jane, if I can get you to hold up your treasure hunt sheet for oh, me. Yes. My, is this, uh, is that reading right? It's perfect. Thank you, ladies. During the uh, online event, you'll see a number of these. This is for the treasure hunt. Please note the number down and hold it against the time we deliver. Jane, thank you so much for being with us today. Don't forget that you can connect with Jane at janeannkrentz.com and there's a lot on there as well as Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Book Club and Goodreads. Jane, thank you so much and we look forward to seeing you here in Australia at some time soon. I'll be back. <laughs> thank you for having me today. It was great to see you all. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>